All right, everybody, it's Tuesday night. It's July 5th. I hope everybody had a wonderful July 4th safe holiday and fun holiday weekend. I am thrilled to have, frankly, one of Vanderbilt's pioneers in football, Doug Nettles, with us this evening. Doug, good evening, and I hope you're doing well out in San Diego, California. Good evening. Yeah. Well, it's good afternoon here still. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, we still well, got sunshine out there. Oh, I can see it reflecting. I know that's one of the, the great areas of the country for weather. And speaking of another, oh, we got Mad Dog. Coach Jeff Madden is in the house with us tonight. <laughs> hey, Coach, thank you for joining us. And Doug, as folks roll in, I'm going to let you know who's here with us. Okay, good. For those of you who don't know Doug's journey or don't know of the time period when Doug played, then you don't know Vanderbilt football history. He came in in the early 70s. He was on the Peach Bowl team. Great NFL career. But before we jump into all of his journey, Doug, I want to, A, thank you again for being with us. And B, I know that you're happily retired on the West Coast, but catch folks up. What's going on in your world? I know you have an awesome daughter and you just, you you don't sit still. I know that. So share (laughs) with us a little bit about what's going on with you. No, I, um, you know, I again, you know, after uh, leaving Vanderbilt, uh, went on to play seven years in the National Football League. Uh, six with Baltimore, Baltimore Colts, the original Colts, and uh, one with the New York Giants. Uh, retired in 1980 after 1980 season. Went into medical sales uh, for, I guess, about 20 some years. And then I started teaching at a private boys' school for the last uh, 18 years of my career. That's where I finished up. Uh, after I got tired of sales and running around hospitals and all that type of thing. Uh, I kind of wanted to sort of, I guess, sort of give back, and 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 I enjoy always enjoy teaching, and so I went into teaching and coaching uh, football track and uh, teaching American history at a private boys' school in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and about three years ago, uh, decided to pick the right time, right before the pandemic, especially, uh, to move out here, San Diego, and uh, uh, it's been a great decision. Uh, but you pay for this weather. There's no doubt about it. This is not, this is, this is a very expensive place to be, but, uh, you know, like somebody, they, like the guys I play golf with every other day, they tell me, you know, you got to pay for California weather. So, uh, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I appreciate you sharing that with us. I do have to ask at the outset, which is harder, what it was harder for you trying to tackle Walter Payton in Soldier Field in the middle of December, <laughs> or trying to teach 10, 10th grade boys to pay attention to history lessons in the classroom. I think it was Walter Payton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, coming in as a professional athlete, uh, there was an intimidation factor with the boys. So mm-hmm. all I had to do was raise my voice and everybody shut up and got in line. So <laughs> uh, speaking of Walter Payton, uh, it was the first time that I remember being knocked out. Uh, I remember sitting in the locker room, you know, in those days, there was a lot of big running backs with OJ and Zonka and all those guys and Earl. Uh, and I looked up and it was Walter Payton's rookie year. And uh, I remember looking at the program right before the game. And I said, wow, they got a little bitty running back starting a little guy, only 195 pounds. Mm-hmm. And Fred Cook, our defensive man, knew Walter because his grandmother lived in Jackson, uh, Mississippi. So he said, let me tell you something about this little running back you're talking about he's not a little running back and I didn't listen he came up came off tackle and 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 uh, our linebacker filled and I came up outside he bounced it back outside and when he saw me he just boom and the only thing I remember is him getting up and I didn't and uh in and, and those days you know it wasn't that where everybody stops and sends you to the sideline you don't come back Mm-hmm. I went to the sideline and the doctor says, Doug, what's your name? I said, Doug. He says, where are you? I looked up. I saw this thing. So did you feel? I said, so did you feel? He says, okay, you can go back. I walked back into the Chicago Bears huddle. That's when they took me out. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that was before concussion protocol. Yeah. That's for sure. My gosh. A couple of hard hitters have just joined us. Rod Keith, one of my former teammates, and Kenny Cole up in North Alabama. Thank you, gentlemen. Of course, I've got Doug Nettles, number 25 in high school, number 30 at Baltimore and in the pros. And I think you were 25 at Vanderbilt also, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I made a point of that before I came. I said, you know, I, I got to have 25. So if anybody's got it, you got to get rid of it. Well, let's, Doug, with, with you growing up in a military household, I know that you moved quite a bit. You lived overseas. You lived in different states as a child growing up. But you've had some really, as a child, unique experiences. And I've read a little bit about this, that when you lived in Georgia, your family, you, you actually marched with Dr. King. Yes. Can you share a little bit of that experience with us? We, 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 it was during a segregated time, obviously. And um, we, we had just moved back from uh, Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, we were stationed, my father was stationed in, uh, in Morocco. Um, so we just moved back and the first school we went to uh, was a segregated school and my mother hated that mm -hmm. and so um, but there was no option so she petitioned to for us to go to a new school uh, on Albany State College's campus Hazard Elementary School mm -hmm. and um, so we got in the base uh, got us into the, into the school the principal of our school um, and it was on Albany State College's campus. Principal of our school had uh, gone to school, to college with uh, Dr. King. And so when Dr. King came over to visit as they were getting ready for the marches in, in Albany, Georgia, uh, suggested that if the kids would like to come, then he would be open to bringing them in and, you know, uh, letting them march. Uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, I found out later, I wasn't supposed to because of my military uh, background, my dad. Yeah. The military are not allowed to, we weren't allowed to participate in the protests and everything like that. Uh, but when the bus came, I remember the day that Dr. King came to our school. Uh, obviously I was a little guy and uh, he looked like he was about like nine feet tall. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had that really deep voice and he, he, he liked to laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. And I remember that about him. Uh, but it, you know, just being in awe of him um, was was phenomenal. Um, so we got on the bus and we rode down. And uh, the story was that just as we were marching and going down the street, I don't know how my mother found me. I, I, I really don't. But the next thing I know, there was a hand on my shoulder. And my mother, said, where are you going? And grabbed and took me away. And I said, I'm, you know, what are you doing? She said, you can't do this. If, if, if the military finds out you've done this, your dad's in trouble. So I guess I marched for about 10, 15 minutes before my mother pulled me out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But for the military component, I'm sure you would have yeah. been there. And then later on that evening, we were watching the news and my mother started looking at uh, the news. And when the police start pushing the kids and everybody around, she said, come here, I'm gonna show you something. And she pointed to the television. She said, see, that's what would happen to you. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, you know, I had the experience. So. Wow. Well, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that experience in, in a minute, Doug. I know during your high school years you moved to the Florida Panhandle, mm -hmm. Rutherford High School, Panama City, not too far from my hometown of Dothan. And during that time period in the late 60s, being living in, in the South, that part of Florida, very much the Dixie South, right. and being an athlete. I'm sure that just created more hurdles for you and your friends to do the kind of things you wanted to do, to yes. be a normal, to be a normal kid. Yes. But, but with the military aspect of that, I guess I should ask it this way. Did moving to Panama City, was that also military based or military reasons? Yes. We are my bad. We, after we left, um, uh, after we left Georgia, we moved to Okinawa. Uh, and we were at a Cadet Air Base there for like three years, uh, but that was another experience because that was doing Vietnam, and my dad would would well he did it like three or four times he would have to go to Vietnam uh, for two or three months at a time, um, and I remember being when I turned sixteen over there, getting a job cutting grass, and uh, one day um, one of the guys didn't show up, so the guy asked me, "Can you drive a tractor?" I said, "Sure." So he said, okay, I'm gonna put you on a tractor and be cutting on the flight line. And so he said, when you hear a siren, you gotta come off. So, okay, okay. Heard a siren, moved off near the, uh, uh, the huts uh, the, in the, the, the hangars. And uh, I remember um, 
seeing, and it wasn't the bombers because they were bombing North Vietnam at that time. They were taking off from our, from our air base. And I remember it was a C-130 cargo plane pulled up. And uh, all of a sudden the back of it came off. And then I looked up and I saw these uh, 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 ambulances coming out, uh, military ambulances coming out. And uh, I'll never forget watching them pull these body bags off the back of this plane. So late on that afternoon, and I didn't know what they were. And mm -hmm. so late on that afternoon, we were at dinner and I tested dad. Let me ask you a question. I said, what? I said, I, um, I told him what I was doing. And I said, um, what were those bags they were pulling off? And he said, shut up. And I just real quick. And I said, uh, okay. So afterwards, he came up to me after dinner. He said, uh, you know, those were body bags. I said, what? He said, I said to dad, there was like hundreds of them. He said, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I, and he didn't want me to say anything in front of my sisters and my mother. Mm -hmm. And so then he, he sat me down and explained what was going on. And so uh, the, the, the conversations that were going on in the United States at the time, uh, we were doing so well, uh, I knew as a 16 year old, that wasn't true. Because mm -hmm. I saw it, I saw it firsthand. So I knew that wasn't true. Uh, so when we came back to uh, the United States, um, and, and one of the reasons we came back was in 1968 when Dr. King was shot. And we were sitting at the dinner table and my sister, my, my, I guess my, she was about maybe 10 at the time. Uh, mom and dad were talking about Dr. King being assassinated. And my sister says, who is Dr. King? And then my mother looked at my dad and says, it's time for us to go home. And that's when we came home. Um, and, uh, and then when I came back, um, I, I was really concerned. As a matter of fact, we were driving from um, California through to Panama City and our car uh, overheated. And my father had to get a new radiator. And the guy was at the, at the uh, service station said, uh, Sarge, um, I can't do anything till tomorrow. He said, uh, you're going to have to, you know, look at here. So my dad said, you recommend a hotel. And this was in the middle of Texas, in mm -hmm. all places. Mm -hmm. And so um, he said, uh, well, we don't really have any place for Negroes. And he said, Dad, well, where, where am I going to go? He said, well, let me see what I can do. So there was a hotel downtown. And he and my dad went and talked to this guy. Luckily, the guy was, had been in the Air Force and took pity on my dad and said, okay, I'll let your family have a room, but you're going to have to go up the back stairs, but you have to, you have to, family has to stay in that room. They can't come out. I can't let anybody see your family walking around the lobby or being in a hotel. Um, so we, my dad would go out the back and picked up sandwiches and brought us in, but we were tired because we'd been traveling a whole day and a half. Um, and we ate in the hotel, in the room. Uh, all of us in one room. I think I slept on the floor. And um, then uh, the next morning, my dad got up early. The guy got the part, fixed it, and we got out of Texas. So when I got back, uh, I, I was uh, I was a little angry, you know. And I think that un unfortunately, uh, all of America was angry, either one side or another. Either we were angry because. Um, we weren't accepted and whites were angry because we were trying to be accepted. And so it was a revolving time. I remember going to a track meet my senior year, coming back to school. We went to Pensacola for a track meet, came back into school about one o'clock in the afternoon and the school was empty. And there were two policemen standing out in front. And he said, what are you guys doing here? And the coach says, what do you mean? What are we doing here? We're coming back to school about track meet. He said, uh, well, school's out. He said, what do you mean school's out? He said, yeah, there was a riot here today. And so our school was closed for like two or three days. My senior year, we didn't even have a prom because of the, the, racial, the racial unrest. So, so by your senior year of high school, you've had all of these real world life experiences and it leads you up to now making a decision because you were a dedicated and accomplished athlete. Mm -hmm. What were you going to do with your college experience your college career right. was was sports always going to be a component did you know that you wanted to play football or or run track or or do something in college sports wise uh athletics was my ticket to college put it that way 
-hmm. But I wanted to be a, I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to go to law school, mm -hmm. and um, and I wanted to get out of the South. You know, by that time I'd had enough of that, um, and so I had actually signed two letters. Uh, I was even going to go to the Air Force Academy. I think that was more of a, you know, getting to be an officer and boss my dad around. I remember telling, I said, you know, when and I was accepted, so I was good. I said, you know, when when I get my my bar, uh, you answer to me. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, you better not ever take that uniform off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but then at the last minute, I think I'd had enough military life. And I signed with the University of Iowa uh, in Florida State. And so one of those things, that, and I, and I hey, actually- you, you signed with four schools? Well, in those days you could. You could sign mm -hmm. with a letter of intent with each conference. Uh -huh. So at the Big Ten, I signed with uh -huh. Iowa, uh -huh. uh, independent with Florida State, at Air Force mm -hmm. Academy, and uh, I had I had no idea about Vanderbilt at all. Mm -hmm. And our counselor um, was good friends with my coach's uh, wife, and she called me. Uh, my senior uh, counselor she called me in his office one day. And she said, "Hey, I understand that you have a, a scholarship offer from Vanderbilt University." I said, "Yeah." I said, "Where is it?" She said, "It's Nashville." I said, the country music place? She said, yeah. I said, I ain't going there. So uh, she said, no, 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 no. And so she opened up the book and started showing me all these statistics about how it was the one of the top schools in the country and everything like this. And she said, don't you want to be a lawyer? I said, yeah. She said, well, they have one of the best schools in the country. I said, oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll take a look at it. So I remember calling um, Coach Schmidt up, <laughs> was the one who recruited me. And I remember calling him back. I first told him I, I wasn't thinking about it. And I called him back and said, yeah, I, I guess I'll take a trip out. So I did. And uh, Taylor Stokes uh, picked me up and showed me around for about five minutes. Taylor took, took me to the game, brought me back to a party, introduced me to this girl to make sure he gets into the, uh, his hotel tonight and took off. That was the last I saw of Taylor until I got back in office. <laughs> And oh. um, so uh, I went back, went home and said, uh, well, my counselor, I said, yeah, it's a, it like a pretty good school. I walked around, but, you know, I don't I think I don't think it's for me. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm getting out of South. I'm going to Iowa. So uh, or Air, over to Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. And um, so one thing led to another. So one day I get this. I kept getting all this mail. I mean, I, you know. I had a pretty good senior year. I mean, I had this one game, Coach Smith talked, always talked about it, where I ran five touchdowns and 300 and some odd yards in one game. Well, actually, in a half. And, and, and who out. was it against? Who was yeah. it against? Pensacola, Woodham. And who was, who, who was their quarterback? <laughs> David Lee. <laughs> David never let me get that. He, he, he said, you know, you, you, really, you really put a dent in my, my, college, my uh, scholarship offers that type of thing. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, this is David Lee who ended up quarterbacking at Vanderbilt and yes. later a teammate mm -hmm. of yours. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah. So um, then um, one day I get this letter and it, 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 it didn't have a return. It wasn't an official, it was just a letter addressed mm -hmm. to me and our coaches. And my coach would always pick up our mail and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So he called me down to his room one day. He said, Doug, he said, you got another letter here. He said, but it doesn't look like it's from a school or anything. I said, okay. So I opened it up, I'm sitting in his office, opened it up. And it was the uh, Ebony article that Perry Wallace had done where he talked about uh, um, his experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not a very flattering uh, depiction of, of his experience at Vanderbilt University, but it was the truth. Mm -hmm. And it was a Xerox copy of that article. And at the top of it, it said, the same thing will happen to you. Don't go here. So I handed it to my coach. He looked at it. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. I think you need to talk to your parents about this one. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I went home and told my, showed them to my, my, my parents. And as a, from a military father, he you know, looked at me. He said, uh, this is a problem. I said, yes, sir, it is. And he said, uh, uh, but you have to answer one question. I said, what is that? He said, first of all, it looks like no, somebody does not want you to come here. I mm -hmm. said, yeah. He said, now this is the question, why? And that what, what read it, and, and so that's, you know, kind of stuck with me. So I jumped on a horn, I called Coach Schmidt out and Coach Patterson, who was also recruiting me at the time, mm -hmm. and told him what had happened. 
And um, and so I'd had my official re re recruiting. So I hope statute of limitations has run out on things from recruiting. So uh, Coach Patterson says, well, we're going to bring you back up. And I think you need to talk to Perry himself. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I said, well, I've had my, my trip. So he said, don't worry about that. Could you be at the airport Saturday? I said, yes. He said, okay. And I got to the airport and he was standing in the airport. We got on a private plane, went back to Nashville. Um, and then when I get there, um, somebody picks us up in his car. And um, all of a sudden we roll up in front of, not Vanderbilt, but roll up in front of the Capitol downtown. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, is this not your school? He says, no, 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 we're gonna meet a few people first. So we go into this, go up to Capitol, go into this room and there's Chancellor Hurd, uh, Al Gore's father, I think it was governor at the time and Howard Baker. And uh, I, Senator Baker and the rest of these guys and they look at me and he said, uh, we need you to do this. Um, and so, uh, and our conversation, you know, went on from there. And so, uh, I went back home. Uh, oh, so then we go to, they were playing, Vanderbilt playing Kentucky at that time. And after the game, I met Perry and we met at this little pizza place. I can't remember what, Pasquale's or somewhere way out there. And, um, it, was, it turned out to be our favorite place to go after that. And, uh, so Perry had a real frank conversation um about him saying yeah everything that you read was true he said but if you don't come and he mentioned walter taylor's there and he said uh you know taylor's going through the same thing i'm going through he said and i had uh godfrey but godfrey left me um and i had got a chance to meet godfrey when i was there in january great guy i love him um and uh so what's going to happen if you guys bolt on me you know set us all back so then I met Walter and uh, Walter was going to Western Kentucky uh, with he with uh, his buddy. And so Walter and I started talking and then one night he called me after I got back. He said, look, are you serious about coming? I said, uh, now I think I am because my mind sort of reverted back to all those things that had happened to me, the marching with Dr. King and the, the riots and everything that happened. Uh, you know, and so I said, you know, yeah, in my conversation with Perry. So Walter said, I tell you what, I'll call you tomorrow. So he called me tomorrow. He said, if you go, I'll go. And that was how we, how we both ended up there. So the impression that you got meeting with those white men of power in Tennessee at the Capitol, how, how was that? conversation in comparison to your frank conversation with Perry at the pizza place that had to have been two different contrasting communications to you it no, must have it, ping ponged you in your in your head I, yeah it was I mean it, it was two different conversations coming from two different directions mm -hmm. but they all ended up the same place right well that that's what I was, yeah. was going to say is they all had the same desired outcome and that was for you to come to school there. Yes, yes, and, and, and um, their conversation was that you will be protected, mm -hmm. put it that way. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about anything, you'll be protected, okay? And um, and I figured, well, hey, these are the guys swinging a the hammer, they got it, you know, mm -hmm. you know it, it's gotta be real. And so I, I, I did out, feel protected. Did you ever figure out who sent that letter to you? Never, never. The only thing we knew that it, it came from Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Now it was either, you know, somebody uh, uh, of African-American descent who looked at it and said, don't do that. Right. Or someone who was white, who wanted well, to that, That's what I was going to ask you. Cause I, I, not knowing about this letter, mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at it from both, both perspectives, if I, if I could, mm -hmm. but step back for just one second. I want to ask you, did you ever have all during your recruiting process, was there ever an underlying current or pull that maybe you felt like you needed to go to an HBCU? Did that yes. ever, was oh, that yes. there as well? Yes, yeah, 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 obviously. Um, and Walter felt it too. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Walter felt that, you know, that people were saying he should have gone to Tennessee State mm-hmm. and followed Joe Gillen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's easy. I'm not, I, I played it behind him in, in high school. I'm not going to play behind him in college. So I'm not going there. Right. So uh, right. FAMU, Florida a m was where everybody was selling me. Well, when you mentioned go. Florida State, that's what right. immediately came to mind. Yeah. Um, but I think that it, it was that era of mm-hmm. where all of a sudden the South was opening itself up. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, uh, and it's been said a number of times that, and people will always point to the Alabama USC game, right. uh, doing most for race relations, just as much for racial, racial relations as the marches and Dr. King had done, because yeah. it changed people's minds. And it also, athletes were the one acceptable person mm-hmm. that even the most staunch racist could be. I mean, People love their Alabama football more than they did their racism. Put it that way. Yeah. It, well, when Sam Cunningham and Charles Davis ran through Alabama those two different years, you're right. That that's that some of it is lore about Coach Bryant going into the uh, USC, all that stuff. But just to see what Sam Cunningham and Charles Davis did right. to the, the vaunted Alabama defense, you're you're right. exactly right about right. that. And there's there's many books, many interviews about that. But Doug, I have always wondered about the African-American athletes who come from the South, mm-hmm. who play were respective sports and they want to play in college. Was there, I don't know if this is the right word. Did you have any, any guilt by not going to an HBCU? Did you feel any of that? Or was it, I really don't have that. I need to make the decisions best for me, not necessarily what everybody else wants mm-hmm. for me. No, I never felt any guilt about that. I think that, be, and, and mainly because, as I said before, um, we all came from different directions, and we all had our 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 uh, our, our strength as to how we would attack uh, this racist uh, doctrine. Uh, mine was athletics, uh, and I, I felt that once Walt and I both felt once we made the decision to to follow Perry and and Taylor that that was going to be it mm-hmm. and that uh we were not going to look back and uh you know you you someone oh, once said you know looking in the rear, rear view mirror is not going to help you get where you're going mm-hmm. and so we you know we we just constantly put our head in the sand and and, and kept going there were lots of uh were well, a couple uh things that happened in the beginning our south our freshman and sophomore year that we almost got off the train but luckily we stayed home, you know, well, and, and before, kept going. Doug, before we get to, to those experiences, we, we got a whole bunch of Commodores who are here for you tonight and they've <laughs> rolled through so quickly. I can't get to them all because they, they've rolled off Scott Penny, Julie Caldwell, Jim Arnold. Um, who else? I'm, I'm looking right here. Uh, as they ro- as more roll through, I'll let you know who's there. Okay. Doug. Guys, of course, I'm talking with Doug Nettles coming out of Panama City. And he's just sharing some some real world experiences. And, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Wallace is no longer with us, but Mm -hmm. Andrew Marinus wrote a phenomenal book and the university Mm -hmm. finally recognized Mr. Wallace's contributions to the campus, to Nashville, frankly, to, to the bigger society. It was not until this past February under Candace Lee, they brought back or had a, a weekend for the pioneers. Mm-hmm. And I don't recall, were you in attendance? No, I, I and, and, and I, I regret that I wasn't able to go. Um, it was right after my induction into the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And I was there that week. And so Taylor and, and Candace never said, are you coming back? I'm like, whoa. I, you know, it's a five hour trip with, you know, cross country is just a bit much. And, you know, it's like doing it in the middle of the pandemic. And so I said, I wish I could come back. I wish you guys would have told me I'd have just stayed over or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I had to get back and I couldn't get back. Uh, I hate I missed that. I really wanted to come back for that. Well, I, I didn't bring it up certainly to it and embarrass you. I know that there were 20 or more pioneers right. who came that weekend, but you've now, you've led me to what I was going to get to before that is that your induction into the Vanderbilt Sports Hall of Fame, and frankly, long overdue. And I wanted to to ask you your, I guess, what were your initial thoughts 
when you learned of your selection and how was that weekend for you? I'm sure there were a range of emotions, but I don't know. I, I guess what I would say, and I don't mean to be critical of the, the athletics department, but now that I think we have some real stability and I like where things are going, but that's another conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. But I was so pleased for your inclusion, your selection. Can you take us a little bit into that experience uh, albeit one that was long yeah. overdue. I was uh, actually, it was, uh, I think it was a Sunday morning or Saturday morning. I was sitting on the back, uh, you know, smoking my little cigar and looking at the uh, mountains and everything like that. And the phone rang and um, um, I thought it was Tennessee. And I'd say, oh, okay. Maybe it was Walter calling from another phone or something. So I pick it up. And uh, it was, it was uh, Candace. And so, you know, she introduced herself and I'm like, wait a minute what so she tells me congratulations we've been uh you've been selected to be in the hall of fame mm -hmm. i immediately thought walter was doing something you know you know trying to make like a, a joke practical or joke yeah and um that's and a heck I, of a joke <laughs> yeah but i i didn't know you know that's kind of stuff he would pull so i'm like okay wait a minute, hold on a second so uh you know i was like in shock mm -hmm. after all these years 50 years i mean whoa whoa okay um and so I, you know, said, thank you. And, you know, I'm really honored and hung up the phone. And then I'm sitting there, I'm like, wait a minute. So, so then she said, and Walter Overton's coming in with you. And I'm like, uh, really? She said, I already talked to him. She says, as a matter of fact, I had to tell him not to call you because he was getting ready to call you to tell you. And I told him I wanted to call you and tell you. So right after I called him and told him, I said, uh, is this real? He said, I don't know. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was teasing Coach, Coach Lee, I mean, uh, uh, Candace about, I said, you know, it, it was kind of cool that you say something that, you know, is probably the, the, the greatest honors I've ever had in my life, but I can't tell anybody, you know. So Walter and I would call each other like every other day. Is it in a paper yet? Has anybody said anything? No, no, no. And then finally he calls us, it was in the paper today. So I guess we can tell everybody. So. Uh, uh, we, we were like over the moon and the weekend was phenomenal. Uh, my sisters came up, my daughter came up and, um, and, and, and we had a really good time. They, you know, the, the one, the, the thing that kind of started it off was when I walked into the, my hotel room, uh, it, my window of my hotel room overlooked the stadium, kind of like the picture behind you where I could just see the whole stadium. I'm like, wow, this is phenomenal. Uh, the only down part was it was like 17 degrees with a 20 mile an hour wind. Well, <laughs> I was, well, compare that weather from your recruiting trip so many years ago. Wasn't it in January yes. or so during basketball yeah. season? It's yep. hit or miss. You know the weather in Nashville. You yep. could have six inches of snow or it could be 65 degrees. Right. Yeah. That was, that was, that was you know, I'm like, whoa. And my sisters came up from Florida and they were like, you know, freezing to death, you know. Did they even have appropriate winter weather <laughs> coats? For the I weekend? told them it was going to be cold. So they kind of pulled out everything they had. <laughs> I think my sister went shopping, you know, when they got there to get some wool and stuff like that. But, uh, well, well, how special was it to be inducted with Walter Overton? It was great. It was great. And, and, I, and I got, I, I called Taylor uh, Stokes and had him sit with me. And so it was like the three of us back together again. And um, uh, David Cully was supposed to come. David yeah. called me. You know, David and I have been friends ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, so David had called me that week before. This is before he got his letter of, you know, goodbye. Yeah. Um, and so he said, uh, I'm coming, uh, I'm going to sit at your table, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And he still has a place in Tennessee. And so, uh, and then all of a sudden I, a couple of days before, you know, he, he got canned. And so he said, I, I can't come. He said, because, um, uh, I was scheduled to do surgery and because of the firing, I've only got this week before, uh, I'm officially off the books to get my surgery done. So he said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to buy a table. And I'm, 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 he said, I've already got in touch with Brenard, Dennis, Wayne Bugs, and all the other guys. And so they're going to sit at the table. And they were sitting right behind me. So not only to be inducted with Walter, 
but to have Taylor there and all the, I call them the, my understudies, I always tease Breenard about, you know, my backup for so many years. Uh, he said, yeah, you know, you've ran me to, uh, to, to play free safety. I said, well, you know, that was a better position anyway. And that so that was special too, to have all my buddies back together. Well, all that athletic talent in the 70s with all this, you just mentioned four guys who played in the pros. Yeah. But we're, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit. I have so many things to talk with you. That's cool. That's about, cool. Doug, I, I'm just, I'm fascinated and I sure appreciate you sharing all of this. Uh, Mark Matlock has just joined us. Thank you, Mark. Um, Doug, let's back up. Let, let's back up from leaving Panama City. You, you and Walter have decided you're coming to school, mm -hmm. even though you're still in the South. You're being told that you're not going to have the exact same experiences, hopefully, that Perry has undergone. But probably in the back of your mind, you knew it wasn't going to be easy because you had to play at Old Miss in Athens. You had to go to Gainesville. You had to go all over the southeast to play it eventually. You couldn't host all the games at home. But even the home games, I'm sure, weren't 100% uh, easy. You get to campus. At that point, did did it before that point, did it dawn on you or had you observed that one, it was a largely white student population, and two, the racial makeup of this of the team was what it was. Right. I can't put myself in your shoes by any stretch of the imagination, but I want to learn how do you protect yourself? How do you and Walter and the other African-American athletes deal with that on the sports field and in the classroom, on the campus and those kind of things? It was tough. Um, and we found out the hard way about how uh, hard academically Vanderbilt really was. Our first semester there was, uh, I'd say, one short of a nightmare. Um, it was, I think, we were rarely sleeping. Uh, we were, you know, those are the days when freshmen could not play. So we had our own freshman team. So we were like punching bags for the varsity. And then we'd go after they got to beating up on us. Then we would go and practice ourselves because we had to play five games mm -hmm. sometimes. And so, you know, it was, it was uh, physically demanding. And, uh, and then we had to go back to, uh, they gave us tutors, so we had to go to our tutor. We had to go to tutors, study hall, um, mandatory breakfast, and and back to classrooms. You could not miss class. You know, um, uh, we even had to post our uh, our schedule on our door. And it was somebody, one coach, whoever it was. I don't know if you guys did the same thing, but a coach would come around and not and check your schedule. And if you had an eight o'clock class and it was eight oh five, he didn't knock. He just opened the door because you weren't supposed to be in there. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of things, and so that was demanding. Um, and uh, you know, um, to be honest with you, there were a few professors who did not want me there, mm -hmm. and you could tell they did not want me there. Uh, a lot of the students uh, did not want me there. Now, the one thing that I can say, with all honesty. I never experienced any of that from my teammates. Can't say it for the coaches, but I had in those days, but uh, nothing ever from my teammates uh, that that happened. Uh, any type of racial uh, situation. Well, I was going to ask, was the transition easier academically, athletically, or socially? I guess I should ask it in reverse. Was it the toughest socially, the easiest athletically? It was easier socially because of the people we had there. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Murray um, and uh, some of the guys that were there when I was there, mm -hmm. uh, we had a phenomenal group of, of African-American students there at the time that were very helpful. Um, and uh, they took us under their, uh, their wings. Uh, you know, Walter had gone to Perry, uh, had gone to Pearl High School with Perry and, and Walter and them. And so he was a, a, a phenomenal uh, human being helping us uh, get over things. Larry Wallace, who became the first African-American student body president at the time. Um, and so uh, David Lombard and, and guys like that who, who helped us 
it kept us kind of grounded and uh, helped us academically and socially. Uh, we used to have what they, we used to call it the Afro Hut. It was a house over there by where the parking lot is, where, where the gym is now. Uh, it was an African-American. We didn't have any African-American sor sororities or fraternities then. We, we had them later on. Uh, and so that's where we all met in that house uh, that they eventually took away from us. But it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, a, it was a cool place to be. Uh, you know, when, when uh, a lot of the uh, civil rights activists and, and those like uh, uh, would come to Tennessee or Fist or Tennessee State to speak, they would always end up at the Afro Hut later on that as an evening. And, and we would all be sitting around with Angela Davis and H. Rep. Brown and those, those folks uh, discussing, you know, things that they were, they were doing. And so that was good. So it was easily socially because of that. Athletically, uh, it was very hard, uh, like anything else. When you step from high school to college or from college to the pros, that step is, is, is uh, it's, you know, it's very tough. Speed of the game is as we used to call it. Uh, increases. Well, I was going to, I was going to say, obviously each level that you move up within right. the sport of football, bigger, faster, stronger, you can always get stronger. You can't always get faster. But I know that was part of your game. So right. I didn't have any problem with, there. Say again? I didn't have any problem there. Well, I was going to say, I didn't <laughs> know if, if the transition out of Rutherford High School into the SEC, maybe it was the strength and it, part of it was a little harder than the speed mm -hmm. part, because I know that was one of the things you were certainly well, well known right. for. But take us onto the field to some SEC action and take us to Ole Miss. Take us to some place that was hostile. Uh, frankly, and strictly not because you played at Vanderbilt, but because of your skin color. The Ole Miss trip was the one that I remember the most. Um, and we get to, you know, we all had the, in those days, the whole SEC was like this. Everybody had their school color and they had blazers on, you know. We had our gold blazers. Uh, Tennessee had their orange ones, or was it disgusting? But anyway, we'll go there. Um, <laughs> they had, we ended up in a movie one year together, you know, with me and Haskell and Condridge, we were all standing around looking at each other with our gold, bright gold and orange blazers out in front of this movie theater. Yeah, y'all so, blended in real yeah. nice that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we go to Ole Miss, uh, and I think it was our sophomore year, our junior year, and um we get there. So Walter had, uh, no, it's our sophomore year. So Walter forgets his toothbrush or something other. He says, hey, I got to get a toothbrush out of the gift shop, get our key. I said, okay. So I walk up to the table and, you know, I used to have the table out in front. So they, we, we would clog up the, uh, the regular desk. And there's this old guy standing there you know, sitting at the desk and he's handing out the little white envelopes with your keys in them as before the cards. And so, um, he I, he, I looked down, he says, uh, looks at me, and I said, uh, Nettles and Overton. And he, all of a sudden, for some crazy reason, he looks at me and says, who are you with? And I looked down at this monkey suit I have on, I'm like, what do you mean, who am I with? By that time, we had a coach at the time named Coach Cope. He was about maybe five foot six, and he was supposed to have been a small college All-American center. And he was from California. And so Coach Cup was standing there, and he said, uh, what's the problem? He looks at me, he says, uh, we didn't know you had any Negroes on the team. And Cope thought he said the other word. And he was about ready to go at him. And here I am, I think it was about 19 at the time. I had to grab the coach. Oh, Coach, what are you doing? And by that time, Coach Pace walks up. And he says, uh, what's going on? And... Uh, Coach says, he called Doug the N-word. And, uh, and the guy says, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. And if being from the South, you had to know that nigra was a polite word for the other one. Me growing up in the South, I understood that. Coach Cope didn't. So Coach Pace snatches the envelope out of the guy's hand. By that time, Walter walks up. He hands it to us, and we walk in the room. As we're going up this little holiday inn uh, with the pool in the middle with the wraparound rooms, I'm telling Walter what happened. So Walter says, oh no. And this is the time we almost quit. So we get into the room. He says, let's get out of here. 
I said, what do you mean, let's get out of here? So the girl I was dating at the time, her family lived about 60 miles from um, Ole Miss, from Oxford. Her father was a college president at Mississippi Industrial College, um, which was about 60 miles, uh, that later was kind of um, uh, joined with Russ College, where, uh, and so it was a very famous African-American school. And so uh, he said, call Janet's dad and tell him, come get us. So I called and her mother answered the phone and I told her the story and she said, oh my God, okay. So she said, well, let me call Edgar, Dr. Rankin. And so he called me about five minutes later. He said, what's the problem? So I told him, you know, and he was an old football coach before he became the university president. He had coached uh, way back in the day with Eddie Robinson, all those guys. And, and so, uh, uh, and he was basically my mentor. So uh, he says, uh, I said, can Edgar, can you come get us? He said, no. I said, what do you mean no? He says, no, you knew this was gonna happen. And this is why you're there. He said, don't worry about a thing. And all of a sudden he says, do you have my two tickets? I said, yes, sir, I got you two tickets. He says, good, I'll see you tomorrow. And hung up the phone. And I got out the phone, I looked at Walter, said, he's not coming. Walter said, what, he's not coming? I said, no. So we lay back on the couch, on the beds and Coach Pace walks in and he's apologizing, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, okay, coach. So we kind of made up our mind, okay, we're gonna do this game, but when we get home, I'm going to Florida State, and Walter's going to Western Kentucky. So we get down and when we walk out of the room, all of a sudden we walk out the room, there's this Mississippi State trooper standing outside our room, looking over the rail at, uh, you know, the folks out in the pool. So we start walking down the stairs and he walks behind us. So Walter turns and says, excuse me, but are you following us? He said, yes. He introduced himself, polite gentleman. And, uh, and I said, for what reason? He said, your coach will explain it to you. So we get in there and I, I kind of figured something was up. We walked into the meeting room and Coach Pace and all the coaches were standing around, Coach Pat and all of them standing around at the front and we walked in. I said, Coach, I said, why is he following up? He said, well, um, unfortunately we have some uh, death threats and things like that. And Walter, I always tease Walter about this. And Walter says, on who? And I said, what do you think? <laughs> so uh, the next day uh, we get to the, uh, the game. And uh, if you've ever been to Ole Miss Stadium, the locker room's like on the edge, on the side, remember? Mm -hmm. And so the people at the top are kind of, as we come out, I can see the coaches telling us, put, guys, put your helmets on. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, Elgin Fritz and all the big guys were standing around me. And Walter and uh, you know all the uh, you know Lincoln Fuge and all these guys were standing around us. And as soon as we came out, they started throwing stuff over the over the uh, railings at us and stuff like that. And it was bad because you know they beat the hell out of us. And um, but they're still throwing and all this kind of stuff. So afterwards, we get out and we're coming out to get dressed. And uh, we were going to go out the front, but they had placed a tarp up right before where the, everybody, all the people came in uh, at the gate. And uh, there were some buses out there and people were still hanging around the buses shouting obscenities and things like that. So coaches said, we're going to the other side of the field. So we walked um, back across the field to the other side of the stadium where they clean, cleared it out. And this was what changed us. Um, Dr. Rankin and, and, and Mrs. Rankin couldn't stay afterwards because they had to go because of the things that were going on. So I couldn't see them. Uh, but there were four African-Americans in that stadium that day, Walter, I, and uh, Dr. Rankin and Mrs. Rankin, and with another one I didn't know of. And this old gentleman was the one that was cleaning up the stadium and they had artificial turf. And he was driving this tractor that cleans the artificial turf and then all of a sudden, I can see him going back and forth. And then the next thing I knew, I hear this beside me, Walter and I were walking. And he, I could hear him say, young man. And I, I guess I didn't quite wait, didn't think he was talking to me. And he said it louder, young man. And I turned and he looked at me. He says, thank you. And go walk. And I looked at Walter and Walter looked at me. He said, what was that about? I don't know. So we were on the bus going to the airport. I looked at Walter, I said, uh, 
And I kept thinking about what that old man said. And uh, I looked at Walter and said, I'm staying. And Walter said, yeah, I guess we are. And because we kind of realized that this was bigger than us. I mean, there was a lot of people pulling for us to succeed. And there was a lot of people pulling for us to see us in that, in, in, in that setting. And, uh, you know, talking to people, uh, even Horace King, who, who, uh, who integrated Georgia's football team. I saw him years later at an NFLPA meeting. And same stories, you know, that, that, that happened with us happened to those guys. So it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a social movement mm -hmm. in an athletic world uh, that it took us a while to understand what it was really all about. Doug, I, I don't even know how to respond other than to say thank you for sharing your courage. Thank you for sharing what you and Walter stood for because none of us went through that, right. but we all benefited from what you and many others have gone through and did go through. And the fact that that gentleman came over to say thank you is one thing. But then you and Walter recognized the importance of what that thank you stood for. And you're 19, 20 year old young men. You could have easily, as most guys that age do, oh, well, thank you. We appreciate mm -hmm. it. But you didn't. You, you appreciated the moment and the fact that you stayed there. Now, I know there's more to this story because I know that there were conversations either preceding or after that with other African-American, either students or student athletes about whether to stay or not. But it sounds mm -hmm. like that was a pivotal moment, not only in your Vanderbilt career, but frankly, in your life. Right. I know, I know, I'm not trying to overstate it. It just seems right. that way to me. Yeah, it I used to tell my daughter the same thing. She was a, a pretty good athlete herself, went to St. John's University and ran track. And I used to tell her that story a lot and how, you know, that those moments um, helped me to understand what adversity and um, was all really all about mm -hmm. and what it's like to, to, to want something and stay with it. I mean, it's like they said, you know, it's, it's failure is, is, is uh, someone once told me, failure is not taking one more step. That one step that you failed to take, that was the one that was going to get you over the hump and you didn't do it. So, and, you know, and, you know, if Walt and I didn't have each other during those times, mm -hmm. uh, we I, I couldn't, I, I don't think I would have made it by myself. I don't know how Perry did. I used to tell Perry, as a matter of fact, when I was in D.C., Perry was speaking at, I mean, he was teaching at American University at the time. So I saw Perry quite a bit when I was in D.C. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, he even spoke at, the, at uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day at uh, my school. Mm -hmm. And we, we sit down and we talked. I talked to him quite a bit. And, um, and he used to say the same thing, is that, you know, uh, I, I don't know how he did it by himself. And I used to say, I said, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. And he just says inner strength. It's just, you know, my faith kept me going. It, it's your DNA. Yeah. It, it's your life experiences. It's, it's no one else can, can tell you or share with you or impress upon you what you've gone through because they're your shoes, right. your steps. But did, Doug, did those events leading up to, to that old Miss event and then beyond, mm -hmm. did that, how do I say this without being, I want to make sure that I'm respectful. Mm -hmm. did, did that harden you personality wise and close you off to a certain part of society? Or did that open you up to more of society to help impact the change that frankly, just being you and others did? Not that you, and I realize, and, and please forgive me if I misspeak, mm -hmm. you're not, you don't appear to be the kind of guy that's like, hey, look at me, look what I have done. That's not what you're about. I get that. Just doing what you do every day, being who you are, frankly, was so much more than so many other people did. But my my question to you is, did that then harden you personality wise? Where you it then closed you off from certain segments of society or did it help blossom that part Both. of your experience? Both. Both. Um, when I left Vanderbilt, I wanted nothing else to do with it. 
Mm -hmm. Same thing with Perry. And Perry, Perry and I talked about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I wanted nothing else to do with it. I mean, I, I, it was like, you know, you, I, I got these, this blinders on. I'm just, I'm, I, I just got to get through this. You know, I know what I have to do. I know I have to have, I know how I have to act. I know the, the face I have to put on every day mm -hmm. and I'm going to get through it. And then once I got to Baltimore, that was it. But unfortunately, I had to come back uh, that next year because I needed one more credit to graduate. And so uh, Walter, uh, and the first year I didn't go back. And then Walter said, hey, you got to come back and get that degree. And he said, people have been bugging me for about you to come you. back. About you or about yes, him coming They would have been bugging Walter because uh -huh. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't answer the phone. Right. And so he said, uh, uh, you know, people are talking to me every other day about you coming back and finishing your degree. And I said, well, okay, I only need three hours. Mm -hmm. We're even going to story about why. But, um, and, and he convinced me to go back. And that was the next, when I finally went back in 1976 and graduated. Well, uh, but after that, I said, no, no, I don't want to. And then it wasn't until years, years later that, as like Perry said the same thing, uh, years, years later, as you got older and wiser, that you kind of realize that, oh, all right, you know, it's, it's like, you know, when, in, when they got the Hall of Fame um, uh, announcement and invitation, um, it was like, after all these years, uh, I'd never thought, you know, I, I told Candace, I said, I didn't think you guys remembered who I was or, you know, after 50 years or, or anything, you know, I just did what I did and, and that was the end of it. And she said, no, we want to recognize that. And which was great because I think that it finally, um, as I tell Carol, my girlfriend, I said it, it finally, it finally sort of uh, lifted that burden off of me that I didn't have to be angry or uh, all this anymore. That now I can enjoy it. I can enjoy the experience that I had because now I know someone appreciated it because we just, we, we were in this world um, and we thought we were there by ourselves. And so now we know we weren't. From a football perspective, what Taylor and you and Walter and so many who followed those years right after you guys, I mean, it goes without, I mean, it, it's gone too long without saying that you then paved the way for so many other African-American athletes to attend Vanderbilt, but not to necessarily feel the same burdens to the extent, I'm sure there were burdens, but not to the extent that you gentlemen went through. But I have to ask you, I, I am sure that it was thrilling to be picked, chosen to be in the NFL. Yeah. Were you hoping for a franchise north of Baltimore, somewhere not in the south or adjacent? Or when you were picked, you were just, that's okay. I'm going to Baltimore. We're going to do the best we can. I, I don't know if there's, if I'm making any sense. Yeah. As really... a matter of fact, I thought I was going to Dallas because my agent at the time had had conversations with the Cowboys and they were going to pick me um, in the fifth round. They actually mm -hmm. told him we we're going to pick him in the fifth round. Mm -hmm. And um uh, Joe Thomas, who was the general manager of Baltimore at the time, um, found out about it. And so uh, he traded some, a pick somewhere to get ahead of Dallas in the fifth round to get me. Now, the night that I was drafted is a very funny story. because Where, where were you physically the day of the night of the draft? I was playing basketball down at the gym. Wait, on, camp, on campus on campus okay. okay well there was no there was no you know like they do today where everybody's sitting in their living room or at right. like, this motel right. with the fancy suits and stuff like that on uh, no, we didn't have that and, and matter of fact it was that it was 1974 where the world football league was, was also drafting people mm -hmm. yeah. and so that first five rounds went up until eight o'clock that night or nine and so um i was sitting around my room waiting and waiting and waiting and my agent called me and says well if you got things to do you might as well go ahead and do them because it's not you're not going to get to you till like nine or ten o'clock at night 
when they Doug, said was any of this broadcast on the radio? No, no, no it's strictly no, 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 no. phone call. That's it. That you found out, right? Yeah, okay. they would. They would. They didn't even have. They didn't. It wasn't even on television. No, I, I knew. I knew there wasn't right. TV, but I didn't know if if maybe through AM radio out of New York no, or somewhere, no, there was nothing, nothing like that. No, they were all in little, little little stuffy rooms and you know picking people that kind of stuff. So I said I'm going to go. I had, I had an intramural basketball game to play. I said, I'm going to go down to the gym and play the game. So my roommate, I'm not roommate, my guy next door was this guy named Madlock. Uh, I don't know what he's doing now, but his family owned the Madlock Trucking. So I guess he's doing quite well. So Madlock would always, he was always in his room doing something. Mm -hmm. And I was always teasing him. I said, you're lucky you, you know, you're inheriting because you don't ever go to class. And so he was sitting up there doing his thing and, you know, yeah. whatever what we did back in those days. And and so um, I left my door open. I said, Malak, I said, let me tell you something. I said, now, if the phone rings, answer it. I'm expecting a very important phone call. And call me at the gym. And uh, here's the number at the little booth down to the gym. So I'm on the court, guy comes out. I said, Doug, you got a call. I said, all right. So I go and Matt like gets on the phone. He says, Doug, he said, what? Well, you got that call, man. I said, well, what happened? He said, I got bad news. I said, what? I, I, I can't tell you on the phone. You got to come back. So no. I went all the way from the gym no. back to Michael Tower. You know, what the, is he talking about? Yeah. I, I run up the stairs and I said, what, what happened? He looks at me. He says, uh, you're going to Vietnam. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, this dude just called me, said he drafted you. Oh, my God. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, here's the number. I said, holy shit. So I look and call this number. And the guy on the other says, uh, I said, uh, this is Doug Nettles. I was told to call this number. He said, yeah, this is Dick Zmaski, the Baltimore coach. We just drafted you in the fifth round. I look at Matt, Matt like I said, Matt, let me tell you something. I got drafted to play the NFL, not to go to Vietnam. He said, well, I knew what the dude said. Was he that clueless? He wasn't playing a joke on you. No, he was, i put it this way. He was flying a little high. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Put it that way. Yeah. So for about five minutes on that sprint back from Memorial to the, the towers, mm -hmm. there's no telling what was going on in your head. Oh, I was, I was, I was scared to death. I, you know, because, you know, they, and that was what's going on. I mean, you know, Nixon had, had uh, cut out the mm -hmm. college department and they, and they were snatching kids go, go left and right. And well, so now, I was scared now to death. you know you're going to the Colts. Right. So you get drafted in the fifth round, a thrill of a lifetime to be drafted. In all fairness, was it a little disappointing that it wasn't a, a, a franchise Detroit, Green Bay, no. Minnesota, somewhere no. north? Did, no, that this, didn't... no, this was the Baltimore Colts. This was Johnny Unitas, Lenny Moore. I mean, he's right. This, this, no, this no, was, that was that was yeah. a stack. I get it. I get yeah. that part. Yeah. And speaking, of, we got to take a quick pause, Doug. Mm -hmm. We got Taylor Stokes, Dwayne Jones, Tom, Fitt, Dante <laughs> Ferguson. We got a bunch of folks in here sharing some love for you, Doug. Darren Rothenberger, uh, Darren Rothenberg, I'm sorry, Darren, and happy belated birthday. Doug, you get drafted by the Colts. When do they bring you up there? Um, this was in February. Uh, I signed a letter, I think, in March. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we had a rookie thing, I think, in April or May, three days. It wasn't like they do today where they work out and, you know, all year round. Um, and um, so it, um, my and our first year was 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 a wreck. We won well, two well, games. Before we get before we get to that, I, I want to ask about Walter's experience. Was he eligible for the draft? Was he hoping to be drafted? Where was he in his Walter? Walter career? had another year to go, mm -hmm. and he had uh, he was in a car accident mm -hmm. and messed his ankle up, mm -hmm. and so he couldn't play that my senior year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he had that red shirt year and so he had another year uh, so when he came out the next year uh, he signed to Green Bay as a free agent and so he went to Green Bay uh, and Bart Starr I think was the coach and he he, he always uh, was always that was one of his heroes so I think he was more uh, excited to meet Bart Starr than he was to go to Green Bay Packers <laughs> well I want to be respectful of your time, Doug. I could talk with you for the next six hours, but I, I just, I'm so enthralled with your journey and I appreciate you sharing, but I do have a few other things. If you have the time, are you okay for a few more minutes? Sure. I got nothing to do. 
Okay, well, you got a whole bunch of Commodores who are who are here with us as as well and enjoying our conversation. Again, I'm skipping around, but we got to talk about the Peach Bowl. Mm -hmm. I didn't play the Peach Bowl, by the way. That was the year that I that I left. That was Walter and, and those guys who played in the Peach Bowl. Well, uh, I was a little confused because I thought you had been drafted. I was gone. Now, yeah. I went. To, I went. Because, uh -huh. uh, you know, they were, you know, uh, they went and I said, hey, I'm coming to uh, Atlanta uh, for the game. So, you know, I, you know, I might as well have been playing. That was Breenard and, and Dennis. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was at uh, Dennis had an interest there, but we were playing the, uh, the Eagles. Dennis got knocked out and Dennis at the uh, reminded me, he said, when I got knocked out, we were in Baltimore. And the only when I opened my eyes and looked up. The only person I saw were you standing over me and saying, Dennis, you all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask, how was the, the you, you spent three or four years in Nashville, that experience in college. Mm -hmm. You're not that much further north in Baltimore. Right. And that time period is still pretty hostile. It's Baltimore on south. Mm -hmm. How was that now that you're in the professional ranks? No longer on a college and somewhat, somewhat insulated, if you will, as a college student, but now you're a professional. Mm -hmm. And how did you find the relations, if you will, amongst the team within the coaches and the community accepting African American ball players playing for the Colts? It was great. Baltimore was surprisingly, Baltimore is, you know, considered the South, but Baltimore was a great athletic town. I mean, it had a large, very large African-American community, mm -hmm. okay? And so, I mean, with, uh, you know, all the, the African-American great football players that Baltimore had had and baseball players that they, they had had. Well, I was going to say the Orioles had tons of success yeah. Yeah. with African-American players oh, over the years. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, it was um, – it was – we did – I don't think I considered it South anymore. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it was like because, you know, like uh, meeting all those those great football players uh, from the, uh, you know, the Johnny Unitas and, the, you know, the era and all those guys. Uh, I mean, to meet Lenny Moore and him become a real good friend of mine and play golf with him every other day. I mean, it was like a dream come true. I mean, you know, you, you and, and meeting Johnny Unitas and all these guys, you know, and you're standing there with them as, as not an equal, but, you know, and have put on the same uniform. Um, was fantastic and so it, it was it was totally different it was like I had left the south and now it's right where I wanted to be you know and you also again a trendsetter I believe it, correct me if I'm wrong you're the first African-American football player from Vanderbilt to be drafted and playing in the NFL yeah, yeah obviously <laughs> yeah yeah there was only well, but then only following only. you came your understudy Brenard Mm -hmm. And then Dennis, say, I mean, they, by by the time you got a few years into your career, at least now you're recognizing other Vanderbilt fellas on other franchises. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, um, but you know, there were a couple of other guys who had played uh, not African Americans. Kenny Stone, right? Kenny was uh, a real good, uh, real good uh, help to me during my years at Vanderbilt. Well, I was going to ask you, did did anybody tease you for being from one of those smart schools? All the time. It was like, it's like they used to tease me. They was like, Doug, you guys didn't win many games in the SEC, did you? I said, no. I said, but at least we knew why we lost. <laughs> silver linings, silver yeah. linings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Doug, you play for the Colts for several years, and then you end up in New York. Mm -hmm. I don't re recall, was it a free agent signing, or were you traded? How, how did you end up with, in New York? I got cut by the Colts and then, and uh, George Young was their uh, had become their general manager and he had he had been our uh, our director of personnel mm -hmm. and Ernie Acorsi two great guys and they brought me up and I remember walking into George's office first thing he told me he said look before you say anything I'm going to tell you right now I'm going to give you a raise because I know you guys are underpaid with barbers mm -hmm. so I walk in the office and immediately got a raise. And then what? I walk down to the locker room and mm -hmm. Mr. Myra comes down and check, you know, wraps his, puts his arm around me and said, uh, welcome to New York, young man. I mean, it was a totally different atmosphere. 
So, I mean, but we, we weren't winning many games. And we, Ray Perkins was our coach. Uh, that was Phil Simms' first year, and he I had was, a shoulder injury. Yeah. And Scott Bruner, I think, was our quarterback mm -hmm. at the time. I was just getting ready to, to ask you. I thought that it was Phil Simms' rookie year. But obviously, Panama City, sleepy little town, small town mm -hmm. growing up. Nashville, still a small town when you were there. Not today, but when you were there. Right. Baltimore, a little bit more, more metropolitan town. But now you go to the heartbeat of the United States. You're in the Yo, biggest city. Yeah. The cost of living, the pace of life, the ex maybe the expectations. You're a seasoned vet. Mm -hmm. um, did you like that year or two in New York? from a social standpoint, from an athletic it. standpoint. No, I loved it. It was why, why? What was it that New York offered Baltimore didn't, or the, you know, just being in the South, I guess, didn't. Everything. New York had everything. I mean, you know, um, and unfortunately I took full advantage of all of it. <laughs> um, there was a couple of times where we'd be coming over to sunrise, we'd be, you know, because we were in New Jersey. Uh, sure. We go back, we go into the city, sunrise coming up. We wouldn't even go back. And I stayed in the hotel. I, they gave me, uh, you know, to stay in the hotel because mm -hmm. um, I came in the third game of the season. Um, so um, it was a couple of times where we just came in, back over the bridge, went straight to the stadium, security guard let us in, put a towel over my head, got on the uh, bench with a sign for Randy. Let, hey, the trainer said, uh, wake me up for special teams meeting. Mm -hmm. And he'd wake me up, special teams meeting, put the towel back up. You know, so. And New York had everything. It was the disco era, 1980. Mm -hmm. um, it was all happening. It's New York. Um, so, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was something that I said. And by that time, I had really started to think, you know, uh, I think it's either time to go to law school or do something else. Pro football, uh, you know, it's not, it's, we weren't making any money yet. If I'd have maybe stayed till 1982 when they, they signed a new contract for the television, the big bucks, when they started making the big bucks, I might have, might have uh, you know, been able well, to do it. Well, Doug, I was going to ask you, you had, you finally had your degree from Vanderbilt. Yeah. Um, and I know you had mentioned earlier that law school was a consideration, mm -hmm. but father time waits for no one athletically. Right. Some recognize it earlier than others. Others are like Ricky Henderson, who played 26 years of professional yeah. baseball. But what? when was your sign? When did you recognize that now was time to shift to the next phase or next part of my life, and it's not going to include professional football? When I was cut by Baltimore, that was the wake-up call. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, you know, we had a fantastic run from 1975 to 1979, 78. You had three championships. Yeah. 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 In 1975 was probably the, in my whole athletic career, that was one magical year. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, that was a dream. I mean, we, flo I floated through that year. We all did. I mean, we were one in four and Joe Thomas come in our locker room and said, wait a minute. I'm paying too much money. I got too much talent. We got Burt Jones, our quarterback, Raymond Chester, Lydell Mitchell, Roger Carr, um, John Dutton, Fred Cook. I mean, the list goes on of, of people we had. And there's no reason we should be losing. And something happened. Coaches left the room. Joe Ehrman, uh, Raymond Chester, mm -hmm. and Burt and them got up. And everybody sort of, sort of, as we used to say in, 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 in churches, testified. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sort of laid it out as to how and what we needed to do. And uh, there was a little known coach that was with us at the time uh, that had a pretty good career in New England uh, for a number of years, still there, mm -hmm. uh, was an assistant coach with us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Billy, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Billy, I've talked to Billy a couple of times about that. He said he, he, one of the highlights of his early career was that 1975 season. He said, that was a match. He said, I've always been. Every time I talk to, you know, to my players, you know, when he was in New England, uh, is about something I learned about football in 1975. Joe Thomas said that you got to win these nine straight games to get in the playoffs, so I'll get rid of all of you. We won all nine of them. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, and 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 it really kicked off because we were in Buffalo down 21 points mm-hmm. at halftime. And we came back and beat them. We go to Miami, beat them. And then we just made a run. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, I think the only other game or uh, that might surpass any of that was 1977, that double overtime game against the Raiders we played it. I wasn't going to bring that up, but in my young – I was a Ken Stabler fan because he was from Foley, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. Played quarterback. Yeah. But that Dave Casper catch, I've never seen a catch directly over the head. He hadn't line. seen it either. He still hadn't seen it. I think he just threw his arms up there. He did. And it, it when you see in the film, he just did like this, and his yeah. head barely came around when it hit his hand. That was all Stabler. Yeah. He saw he saw Tim Baylor sitting on that mm-hmm. that that uh, that post route, mm-hmm. and he said, "The only chance I got is to throw over his right shoulder and hope he could adjust to it." And that's what he did. Mm-hmm. Two or three more questions. I'm gonna get you out of here, Doug. Mm-hmm. I promise you. Let's go back to campus. You talked about the Afro Hut mm-hmm. with. I assume at different times you visited Fisk, Tennessee State, maybe other parts of the city. When you wanted to get away from campus, when you wanted to get away from football or the pressures of whatever you were dealing with, were there any places around town where you, Walter, maybe some of your buddies, y'all just to let your hair down, play pool, drink some beer, whatever it was that back then were the kind of the places to go to? We didn't have really... um one particular place. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Walter, we both were dating uh, young ladies from Fisk at the time. And mm-hmm. so we spent a lot of time obviously over there, Tennessee State, because, you know, uh, Joey and 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 uh, Sonny Lyons, some of the guys who had played with Walter were at Tennessee State. So we, we spent a lot of time over there. Uh, as a matter of fact, throughout the summer, uh, we would always go to Tennessee State and work out with those guys. Uh, because they were, you know, I guess more of that pro style things that we were as, aspiring to, uh, yeah. for. And so that, that, that was good. And we always, used to, uh, especially in the summer, we'd always meet at the little park over there. I can't think of the name of it, but it's right near, just as you get into Tennessee state, there's a little park over there. Yeah. I don't know the name. Yeah. And we would always, uh, go over there and, and work out mm-hmm. and have these little sessions, all the pros, the guys from Tennessee state. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were already in the pros uh, by my senior year. Joy was already in, uh, in the pros in Pittsburgh. Uh, 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 Johnny Holland was in Buffalo and guys who would come back and be working out with guys already in the pros. So that, that was pretty special. But, you know, I think the one uh, place if I had to mention one was Walter's house. We'd go, you know, his, his mother used to do our laundry on Sunday a lot, you know, uh, Mrs. Overton. And so we would always go over there and have Sunday dinner and she'd do our clothes and stuff. What what part of town did the Overtons live in? They live not too far from Vanderbilt Stadium. Right. What because Walter always talked about it. he used to hear the crowds at night. It was after oh, that. Wow. Yeah. I didn't appreciate that it was that close. Last oh, question yeah. for you, Doug, and I'm gonna yep. get you out of here uh, a lot longer than I had originally had promised. That's no problem. When you think back of your Vanderbilt years and your buddies, the hardships, the the good times. What's what's one memory that you'd like to share that really puts a smile on your face that maybe in your mind says that what I went through was definitely was worth it. I'm proud to, to have done what I did. It was, I think, you know, years later, um, I was in medical sales and a uh, guy came back. Uh, I, I switched from one job to the next. And uh, so uh, they wanted me to work with a, a, a very seasoned sales rep who covered Memphis. And so he covered Memphis in, in, in Nashville. So we, I flew into Memphis to, to work with him. He says, uh, we're going to go up to Nashville. And I guess it was in the 1990s or so like that. Yeah, 1990, early part of 1990. And uh, I said, really? He said, yeah. And so he says, well, let's go over to the stadium and work out. And I'm like, uh, wait a minute. No, I don't want to do that. So he said, no, come on, come on, be fun. He said, do you know anybody at the, at, at the, uh, at the school? I said, no, nobody. But I reluctantly went. And he says, can we walk into the uh, center, McGugan Center? I said, no, not really. But he pulled me in. Luckily, uh, Kelly was still there. And soon as I saw Kelly, he's like, no, he's done. He said, yeah. 
So you need stuff to work out with? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm good. So uh, we're going to go and just run the state steps or something like that. Well, I was out of shape. I got up down the steps about two or three times. The next thing you know, I was sitting next to the wall in the shade. So it was about six or seven o'clock and some of the current players were coming out. Mm -hmm. He goes over and starts talking to him and I'm laying over in the shade half dead. And all of a sudden they start walking toward me and I can't remember who these guys were, but all I remember is he told them who I was and they all reached down and shook my hand. And I said, well, what do I owe this honor? They said, we just want to thank you for being one of the first. And then I sort of realized, oh, wow, this is, uh, you know, pretty cool. Pretty cool, pretty cool indeed that, you know, Understood. yeah. And, and, and that, that put a smile on my face, you know, that I said that, like I said before, the, the, the walls of start to break, start to come down and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, and then it finally just shattered with the Hall of Fame induction. Well, Doug, it's not every day that Kelly puts a smile on anyone's face. <laughs> but he, he did his job yeah. that day and there's no doubt Bill Kelly knows the history of Vanderbilt football and right. appreciates yeah. who, who the people were who built the program. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has truly been my honor for this incredible conversation tonight. So I want to thank yeah. you very much for, for sharing yeah. it with us. Yeah, well, yeah. just a hi to all Taylor and all the guys, you know, Stokely. You, you got a lot of love. You need to get in the comment section. <laughs> and yeah. Doug, hang around after I sign off. I got one thing to share with you. Okay. But guys, so many of you joined us tonight. This is why I do these conversations each week. We're telling the oral history of our program. Older generations are meeting younger generations and vice versa. It's important to know these lessons and who these men are and who these women are. So thank you for keep coming back every Tuesday night from now up through the Hawaii game, which is fast coming. Right. But I put in the notes today or in the, the group, some of the organized events that the Black and Gold Club has put together, a luau, a pregame tailgate, and maybe some other things are coming. So if you go into the game, sign up. The links are in there. Doug, thank you, sir, so very much for your time tonight. Thank you. You guys continue. Anchor down.